in attendance, Mayor Stewart, Councilor Finzel, Councilor Stockwell, and no other uh, councilors are in, are in the audience, are present. <laughs> Um, can I have a mover, mover and a seconder for the confirmation of the, of the planning and environment I'll committee move. meeting held on February? I'll move, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, Councillor Stewart, Stewart Finzel. and Finzel. All in favor? Got it. And Mr. Chair, we've just had the addition of Councillor Lawrence. Too. And Councillor, may note that Councillor Lawrence has entered the room. Do we have uh, any presentations? No deputations? No, no. Okay, we have a report for consideration of the committee. Number one, <coughs> MCU22-0208, application for material change of use for a short-term accommodation at 132 Solar Road, Peroy Mountain. And can we have Patrick and Naveen? Could you give us a little overview of the situation? Yes, I can. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is an application for material change of use uh, for the owners uh, are seeking approval to utilise their existing house for short-term accommodation, uh, mainly when they're not using it. There are no changes proposed to the existing dwelling. They're proposing to utilise four bedrooms uh, and up to eight people, and the whole dwelling will be available for short-term use. Uh, it's been assessed against the code or at the code, relevant code for the planning scheme and has been determined to fully comply with those requirements. I do note there is an error on the front. Um, the land area is actually 4.6 hectares, not 4,000 uh, square metres, so it's 4.6 hectares. Um, this application would normally have been uh, approved under delegation by council staff, however, uh, due to the, um, the discussions that have been held by Council, we thought it was prudent to be transparent and uh, put this matter up for discussion. Thank you, Nadine. Questions, councillors? <laughs> all the, all the, the ridiculous question to start with. It will, it is right on the border of the Sunshine Coast mm -hmm. Council, and I believe that it actually overlooks you know, the Sunshine Coast Council. What would happen if they had very strict rules, which which didn't conform to our rules, and they you know, were very cracked down on short-term accommodation? Or if, if it was flipped, and they had a potential party house right on their border, which would overlook, and the sound would come into Noosa Shire? Uh, this is a code accessible application. We have to assess it under our planning scheme. Um, it adjoins, yes, it does adjoin um, Sunshine Coast Council uh, area, and um, really, there's there's nothing there. We've we've assessed amenity, so we've determined under our planning scheme that it won't impact on an amenity of the area, and that would that includes the surrounding area in Noosa and also Sunshine Coast Council. Uh, there is a site map on page eight. Yeah, it, it, it is it is overlooking. Anyway, yeah. So I think that maybe just to embellish on what Nadine said, despite the fact that those properties are outside of the council, there's still been the amenity impacts is still being considered as Good. part of this yeah. application yes. um, yeah. to ensure. So yeah, the fact that they're not in the Noosa Council Trail area hasn't excluded our contemplation of their amenity impact. And it's in, if it was a rural residential um, application. That's when the, the the land size would would matter because that's in one of the accepted codes where it has to be four point four hectares. Yes. And even that that doesn't matter because it's in rural rural area, so it's it's well and truly within the the planning scheme. That's correct. Yes, it, it fully complies with the scheme provisions. Yes. Okay, did, I, did I see uh, any questions, Amelia? You, you, your hand raised. Um. So, meeting. Due to the significance of the matter, and given that we just um, put out a housing needs assessment, um, we've got a narrow minute on a housing crisis, we've just gone to a summit. Um, is that the reason that you've now brought the application to council for councillors to make a decision on it? We wanted council to be aware that these are the types of applications we are receiving, and yes, we are fully aware of council's. Uh, the, the housing prices 
and we just want the council to be aware of these types of applications. And also, this is a consistent application. Um, the planning scheme um, supports this type of application uh, on this location, on, on this site. Uh, if this application was refused, can the applicant still short-term rent the property, um, be it shorter period? It is, I understand it is their holiday premise, so it's supposed to be their principal place of residence to uh, be able to uh, undertake the four times 60 days. So as an investment property, it actually doesn't have um, those rights That's to a short-term rent for 60 days or four times a year. So, okay, thank you. Take it, note that um, Councillor Wilkie has entered yes, the room. Sorry. Yep, Councillor, do you have a, Frank, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Would anybody like to move the um, oh, just a question. Yep. Um, given the proposal has been um, reviewed against the accommodation code and is consistent with the code's requirements, can you just talk to us a bit about the conditions that have been recommended to ensure amenity and the register of complaints overall? How is this going to be used? It's mentioned on page 12. So we have a range of conditions that we will utilise for short-term accommodation um, approvals, and they're really designed to protect the amenity of the surrounding area, and that will include um, the hours for which outdoor areas can be used. Um, it'll also include um, the requirement for you know a code of conduct to be entered into, um, a contact person to be to be nominated. Um, standard conditions that are similar to ones that are within the local law approval as well, but separate to local law approval, and they certainly give us an opportunity to regulate the property uh, once it's approved. So there's also a condition limiting the number of bedrooms, so four bedrooms and eight people, and there are also uh, this condition about um, outdoor areas, uh, including balconies, decks, pools, and the like, must not be used after 10 pm each night. Um, and there's also to be a, a yeah, there's the complaints register that we've talked about as well. Thank you. Are you confident that with moving forward that the local rules in conjunction with the complaint register will help minimise concerns for community around potential um, problems with noise and... Well, we're certainly finding that the, um, the hotline gives the opportunity for local residents to alert um, the hotline that there is a problem occurring at the property and for that hotline to contact a contact person and for it to be resolved in a, an efficient manner. Um, the data that comes through the hotline is also passed on to council so we can, we can identify if there's an, a problem property and, and take appropriate action under the local law um, and also under the planning approval if required. Thank you. Um, and another question, have you had any correspondence from neighbours or community um, with the complaints around this matter? There was one um, uh, letter that we received in terms of uh, regarding this application, again noting it's a code accessible application, uh, and that uh, letter raised uh, concerns about uh, traffic and uh, utilising the road. Okay, thank you. And are we satisfied that that person's correspondence has been answered adequately? I think the road is uh, appropriate for the scale of the use, noting that it is an existing dwelling and um, uh, it's a large dwelling, uh, existing dwelling, and I think the road standard is, is sufficient to cater for the, the traffic that would be generated by this use. Thank you. Thank you. Amelia? Oh, sorry, sorry, um, Councillor Stockwell. Yeah, mine's out of interest. It probably goes down on record as being the most unusual shaped lot in the shire. <laughs> The only reason I can assume that they did it that way, is it a creek at the back? It doesn't show up as a creek on our overlay, but did you get down the back and see whether there's any values there that we should be thinking about when conditioning a commercial use of the block? No, I didn't, sorry. Okay. Yeah, can't really do anything because it's not showing as a class one, but I presume they've sort of done that to try and maybe get a dam site or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, Councillor Lawrenson. Um, hi, Nadine. Um, amenity condition six that the outdoor areas, including balconies, steps, pools, and the like stuff, must not be used after 10 pm. Um, 
all the other applications that have come before us, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, we stipulated a 9 p.m. Um, outdoor area use. Uh, why 10 p.m. with this application? That feature that the rural residential. So the rural residential. So the smaller lots, the, the more intensive uh, res rural residential areas, we've done uh, 9 p.m. And the rural areas, we've been uh, providing a 10 p.m. curfew. I think it's a case by case basis as well, Amelia. Um, there, there was the, the first property that went through the rural zone was 10 p.m. and we looked at the context of the surrounding area. I think recently there was one that we had at the last round of meetings where that pool was close to the property boundary on the rural residential lot and on that one we actually said 9 p.m. because we wanted to ensure the amenity was preserved for the, the adjoining property. So as a rule of thumb, 9 p.m. for the sort of high density residential areas or the the, um, the low, even low density residential areas and the rural, rural, rural and rural residential will look at 10 pm as a benchmark, but may come back to 9 pm depending on the circumstance. So, consideration is given to proximity to the neighbouring property. Um, do we also look at acoustics? So, if you're perched on top of a hill, I know living in areas like this mm. and sound travels. Mm. Um, so, consideration given to, to acoustics, Patrick? Um, we, well, it's given as much as we can to the specifics of the site without requiring an acoustic report for this type of use. Um, quite challenging, I think, to get an acoustic report to address that, that kind of noise on, on this use. But we'll look at, I think in this circumstance, it's about 150 yeah. metres to the nearest house. Yeah. So we're, um, we're confident that the amenity will be preserved. I mean, if someone in any house, depending on its location, puts some music up to 110, it will have an impact, but the other conditions talked about there being projection of amenity as well. So, um, through, through the chair, councillors just reminding this is a code accessible application. Our ability to be able to work through a more broad up mm -hmm. process is limited, it is code accessible. So, those elements, while yes, in other applications, absolutely, we would look at that type of um, that type of condition or understanding of impacts, um, code accessible um, doesn't allow us to be able to go to that extent. But when we're addressing amenity issues and we're conditioning those impacts, would you not be considering this? Through the Chair, Council, I'm not here to debate you, I'm just here to... Yeah, I'm going to move the motion, I think it's getting into an inappropriate uh, uh, comments from the gallery. Um, so I'm moving the motion. Do we second it? I'll second it. Uh, yeah, as, as was discussed in the new meeting and where all the questions were asked previously, um, this is a code accessible application that complies. <coughs> Under the Act, we are very clear on what we must do and that Act says if it complies with all the relevant benchmarks, Council must approve. There is no leeway. Uh, we should go with the, the uh, staff recommendation. Any other comments? Yeah. Should we put it to a vote? All in favour? It's uh, unanimous. Okay, we're on to item two Planning and Environment Court Appeal number D, what, D14 of 2023 application for a multiple, multiple dwelling, 20 units, and operational works clearing of vegetation at 11C Church Street, Pomona. And we have Patrick at the table to talk us through the appeal. Okay. So this um, this report advises that an appeal has been lodged against the refusal that was issued under delegation for the application for 20 dwelling units and the operational works application for the removal of vegetation at the site at 11 Church Street, 11C Church Street in Pomona. Um, the application was refused on, uh, due to non-compliance for a range of issues including stormwater and drainage, um, excessive cut and fill, environmental impacts and the unsatisfactory built form. Um, it's considered that it's in order for Council to defend this appeal. I'll move the staff recommendation. Do you, any any questions? Okay. Uh, will Council will hear Lawrence? No? Should we put it to a vote? Let's have a vote. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much.
round two. Number three, short stay, letting, or home hosted accommodation, local law, 12 month review. And we've been looking forward to this. Yes. <laughs> and Anita's come to the table along with Patrick. Can you walk us through this? Sure. Um, the purpose of this report is to report back on uh, Council's uh, resolution to undertake a 12 month review of the local law. Um, as part of the review, we undertook consultation with a multi-interest stakeholder group, which had representation um, from a variety of um, STA industry stakeholders, as well as resident and community groups. Um, for, it was it indicated through that uh, consultation that implementation of the local law had been well received by both the industry and um, resident community groups. Um, we received also um, a greater than expected number of applications um, in the first 12 months, um, probably double what we were expecting, um, partly because of the uh, fee waiver period for five months, um, and also because of the response of the industry that they've come forward uh, voluntarily. Um, so uh, in terms of our review and the feedback from, from the stakeholders, we're not proposing to amend the local law, um, but we are looking at making changes outside of the local law uh, to frameworks that support the implementation of that. Um, so, uh, and also increase our resources uh, to support um, dealing with a backlog of applications, uh, as well as undertaking proactive compliance uh, we're also looking at introducing um, a, a annual renewal fee, which was previously deferred by Council, um, and that will, would commence um, as at the 30th of June this year. So the recommendation to Council um, is that we undertake the range of actions which have been identified in the report. Uh, we increase the resources um, to include two additional um, local law assessment and compliance officers on a temporary basis, um, as mentioned, to assess the backlog of applications and proactively undertake compliance, um, and that we commence compliance and enforcement action on properties operating short-term accommodation or home host accommodation without an approval, um, or not displaying an approval sign where they've got an approval, and that the introduction of the annual renewal fee commenced 30th of June um, with a sliding scale of fees uh, depending on the dwelling type and extent of use. So the detached house um, is at a rate of $400 annually. A detached <coughs> house which is limited to um, the use of a principal place of residence for a maximum of four times and a maximum of 60 days, $100. Uh, the use of a unit for short-term accommodation on an ongoing basis, $200. Um, where a unit is someone's principal place of residence um, and used four times at a maximum of 60 days, $100. And home-hosted accommodation, $100. Uh, we also recommend that we continue to monitor the implementation of the, the local law um, and just continue to make ongoing improvements to systems and processes where required and that we'll continue to liaise with the multi-interest stakeholder group. Okay, well there, there's heaps to talk about here. Uh, I'd like to open questions for councillors. The, the report, thank you, Anita, it was great. Um, what you're suggesting and implementations we're going to make, and we've sat in meetings before with residents, uh, in your opinion, if does that meet of us and closed doors for us in our camera? the changes and the additions, uh, does that meet the um, concerns that some of the residents had? Uh, yes, um, particularly the proactive compliance, so taking action on properties that um, aren't, uh, are, who are operating without an approval, um, and undertaking enforcement action on properties who are operating with an approval and without a sign, um, following up um, more readily on um, complaints that haven't been dealt with appropriately through the complaints hotline and have been elevated to council. So all of that proactive enforcement um, and compliance action um, will continue to implement the local law at, at its highest level Great. and deal with um, issues that we receive from the residents and community. Thank you. Good. Oh, question. So. 
one thing that, that, that we saw as this was rolling through was um, you, know, you had vacancies and you needed more people at times uh, downstairs in the department and you think that actually bogged down the process somewhat because you were missing an, an officer, a very important one of the, the team of five was missing for quite some time. Did you actually ever find a replacement to fill that position? Um, so the scale of applications was, as I said, probably double what we were expecting in the first 12 months, so that was one factor. And then there has been um, issues around uh, retention of staff, um, but Patrick might want to elaborate on that. Well, as of Friday last week, <laughs> we were operating at a full complement of staff. Unfortunately, over the weekend, we've had a resignation. Um, <laughs> And, and not necessarily unforeseen, there was just personal circumstances for that officer in terms of where they were going to live. Um, so they've made that decision over the weekend and, and, and have resigned um, effective immediately. So at this point in time, um, there is an officer that we're down, but have a, having had conversations with the team, we're confident that we continue to offer the service that's required and um, we'll, we'll seek to implement the new personnel position as soon as we can. I might just add that the report um, also recommends that we increase the complement to the mm. staff by two additional um, compliance assessment officers to deal with that backlog um, on a temporary basis and also be more proactive in the, in the um, compliance and enforcement area. Mm. Now, this started a year ago and for much of the community it probably seems like an eternity, but for you working downstairs it must have gone pretty quick because you had to, this was all new uh, legislation, new local laws, new enforcement, new, new jobs for NUSA um, staff, like it must have just been like a rolling thing through the year. To moving quickly down there. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, well, it's a whole new area of business and regulation um, for council. Um, you know, the first 24-7 hotline council's ever had to deal with customer complaints. Um, it's in a whole new regulatory framework that um, is the first for Queensland in terms of, um, you know, a local law being introduced to deal with this matter. So it was all new learnings mm -hmm. and setting up systems, processes, uh, a team, training the team, there was a lot involved in getting it up and running, um, but uh, it, it, we've done it successfully. Yeah, I think yeah. it, it's a credit to the team, the volume of applications mm -hmm. that they've been able to approve and work through. Um, we certainly realise that there is a backlog that we will continue to work with. With any new, any new process, there's always some learning and refinement, and the team's been really cognizant of that as well, and trying to improve and, and taking the feedback from the community as to what's working and what's not working. Yeah, but just think that, that that's something to to really look at as us counselors to really look at how the system works and how it's been implemented, that the, the, the trials and tribulations and now going forward. And one thing that it seemed in the beginning we thought it was going to be really hard in the beginning to, to get the applicants and to get the, get get a handful through the door. Well, instead there was a landslide, mm -hmm. and actually the st the hard part of the sticky end is now, and so we had it sort of backwards from our anticipation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was 2,510, wasn't there, that are applicants that have been the last 12 months? So uh, about 2,700 uh, right? odd applications. Yeah. Um, we have a backlog yeah. um, of around 600 that still need to be assessed. Um, but yeah, that was given we're expecting around 4,000. Um, that was around 68% 60 of applications yeah. came in in the first 12 months, which was much higher than expected. And, and on par with Mornington, who took about three years to get to that number. Um, that's correct. And Mornington yeah. Peninsula is uh, still um, implementing theirs and chasing yeah. properties that haven't, they've got a registration process, haven't yeah. registered. So yeah, we're ahead of that game. And are other, you said first in Queensland to do this local law, other Queensland councils looking at this now? I believe so. Some are um, following um, and have the, our, our path and have consulted with us um, on on how we've done it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So the two sides of the coins are one that we aren't doing anything, and the other side of the coin is we're actually really cutting edge here and, and leading leading Queensland for, for sure. Queensland. Yeah. Yeah. Given the, first, the first draft of the local law, it says the report was initially uh, prepared and publicly notified back in 2019. And you know we have had COVID and significant impacts throughout throughout that period. Um, I'd like to make it, um, ask a question about the ongoing fees and charges. And it was suggested improvements identified by the, um, the resident community feedback 
He was talking a bit about um, their recommendation about the complaints hotline um, should be funded not through through fees and charges and not subsidised by the ratepayers. Has that informed the decision around the the cost of the rates for the home host accommodation? Uh, yes. So it was clear from the community resident group that um, the, the implementation of the local law and the ongoing compliance um, and the, the team and the uh, resources required to fund the hotline, that it be um, funded entirely by the um, short stay industry, short term accommodation industry and not by ratepayers um, through the, um, the use of application fees which we already have in place but ongoing annual renewal fees. So it be on a cost recovery basis. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Wilkie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My only request is that when the committees finish discussing this item, if they would be kind enough to refer it to the general committee, please. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I think it. Um, uh, do you have uh, the reason for the, for the um, significance Joe of the matter? Councillor Jurisvik's email the committee requesting the. Due to the significance yeah. of the issue, yeah. I agree with that. Okay. Um, again, I love talking about this in the committee meeting because we're all here, and this, this the, the general is going to be a very, very heavy meeting. So, perhaps if anybody needs to say something of incredible significance in in, a, in, in their speech, make it now. Um, I would just like to say thank you very much for this team. I think it's been an enormous effort, mm -hmm. and um, and I will uh, I'll move that this be. Um, Said to general meeting, second. Councillor Finzel seconds that. Uh, before we close, did anybody want to say anything more? Okay, all in favor? Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Patrick. Patrick. Okay, now we're off to number four. We said council threatened fauna recovery roadmap. And we have we have David O'Gorman and Rebecca Griffin in the room to talk us through this. Welcome, team. Uh -huh. Okay, we are we ready? Can you give us this, this fantastic report? I <laughs> Um, yes, obviously hear about the Threat and Fauna Recovery Roadmap. Uh, you may have recalled back in April 2022, I commenced the development of the, of the roadmap. Um, and that was all in response to the Noosa Environment Strategy, specifically Commitment 1.3, uh, which is to improve long-term survival of threatened species and ecological communities. Uh, therefore, the roadmap has been developed specifically to deliver our commitments under the National Environment Strategy and obviously has formed the scope of the document and the process moving forward. Um, being new to Council at the time, I uh, started in March 2022, so fresh into it and straight onto this, um, this deliverable. The first uh, job for me was obviously to do a comprehensive desktop, desktop review of um, obviously all the other work that has been done in the past regarding biodiversity, fauna, uh, management recommendations across the Shire. Uh, from that process, uh, basically shortlisted 29 species of conservation significance that occur across the Noosa Shire, uh, specifically fauna, not flora. Uh, from there, um, I actually took the draft roadmap to council and it was endorsed for public consultation um, in May 2022. From that process there, I formed an expert panel, uh, which consisted of 10 organisation members, um, including community uh, conservation groups, uh, examples of Mary River Catchment Coordination Group, uh, NICA, etc. Um, also um, involved some expert wildlife consultants as well, and academics and, and whatnot. So yeah, 10 stakeholders contributed to an expert panel who jointly nominated the Noosa 9 that we're discussing today. That was achieved through the completion of a decision matrix. So basically, during the desktop review process, I generated a decision tool which enabled the panel members to actually score the species against the identified threatening processes across the Shire. So they could be things like climate change, uh, development, domestic animals, etc. 
Um, so that occurred, I guess, over the second half of 2022. And since then, we have jointly determined the Noosa 9 moving forward under the roadmap. Uh, the species nominated are the giant barred frog, the glossy black cockatoo, the greater glider, the koala, the tusk frog, the mary of the turtle, uh, the group of acid frogs, the water mouse, and the loggerhead turtle. Now, those species aren't in prioritisation order. Um, they were just simply um, the species that were nominated that were also grouped according to their key habitat type. So I'll take a little step back there. Um, when I shortlisted the species, the 29 species, I also grouped them into their key habitats as well. So that ensured that when the stakeholders, the expert panel nominated the species, we were ensuring that we were getting a representative spread of the species across the different habitat types of the Noosa Shire. The reason for that was to ensure that um, you know, moving forward, our resources are being attributed to not just one ecosystem, but across the whole Shire, and that also complements other environmental strategies under the environment strategy. Um, so since the community consultation process was completed, I finalised the roadmap, and that has resulted in sea turtles being nominated for the 23-24 management priority uh, moving forward. So this decision was made because of, firstly, the conservation status of the species. So loggerhead turtles are classified as endangered. Um, and also, as a lot of people are aware, they've obviously faced a lot of threats over the last couple of years with, with flooding and, and whatnot. So we are seeing a decrease in nesting activity along the, along the beaches and an increased occurrence of um, compromised turtles washing up as well. Um, we also need to consider, I guess, you know, in terms of implementation of the Noosa 9 moving forward is that we need to make sure that we are complementing other um, activities undertaken by Council in that space. And we also need to make sure that we're accessing the, um, you know, available funding streams from grants, from DES and whatnot. So that all, I guess, combined and we nominated sea turtles under those, those, um, those precedents, I guess. Um, therefore, we have also put in funding bids for sea turtle recovery over 23-24 for environmental services. Um, and basically moving forward with actually implementing the roadmap, well, the Noosa Environment Strategy um, basically expires or needs to be updated in 2029. So we're developing a stage approach where we will annually assess which species um, we will prioritise for implementation. And as I said, that will purely based on um, the opportunities that exist for those species, the conservation status of the species, and what other projects council are delivering in that, in that financial year. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk to today is also the opportunity to co-benefit other species. So as I said, we have nominated nine species, and specifically it was nine under the Minister Environment Strategy. Um, but there are obvious opportunities where we can actually create benefits for species that are very closely linked to the Noosa 9. So for example, loggerhead turtles was nominated as a species for 23-24. However, obviously, if you're targeting loggerhead turtles in a recovery action plan, you're going to be targeting green turtles as well, which also nest on our beaches. So there's that opportunity to overlap into different species that are closely related to, and obviously, you know, um, it's more bang for buck, like grant streams, external funding obviously is released and aligns with you know more than one species, but generally there's opportunities, um, multiple species uh, that we're targeting in that, that area. Um, the same thing can be said for the Mary River Cod. So at the moment, we narrowly nominated the Mary River Turtle. Um, however, obviously Mary River Cod, Mary River Turtles sharing very similar habitats and funding streams. Um, we're definitely looking to do joint management plans, um, recovery action plans for both of those species, rather than just concentrating on the one when it's just probably not the most efficient way to go about things. So certainly opportunities for there, but as I said, the Noosa 9 as it stands, um, nine species under the Noosa Environment Strategy, and obviously that reflects resources um, that we're going you know, to attribute to this over the next, um, for the remainder of the Noosa Environment Strategy. Um, so basically, the reason I put this up to Council is for the recommendation that the Noosa Threatened Fauna Recovery Roadmap is, in, is, is approved for implementation. As I said, 
we've undertaken the consultation process, the roadmap has been finalised, we're at the implementation phase now, so that's why it's a council, so I'm hoping to achieve that here today. Um, and then once we've done that, moving forward over the next financial year, obviously be distributing the results and the final roadmap to all of the 10 stakeholders that were involved in the process, combining that with obviously a wider um, community advertisement program as well to push that Noosa Council is delivering their, um, their objectives under the Noosa Environment Strategy for Threat and Fauna Recovery. Um, and that will lead nicely into a sea turtle recovery action plan um, that will be developed prior to the nesting season commencing in November uh, 2023. So I think that sums it up, but yeah, if you have any questions, we're happy to field them. Well, a question. Yeah. Well, oh, thank, you. thank you, that was comprehensive, thank you. Um, I'm interested in your expert panel and your 10 yeah. stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, can you just talk to me a bit about that? Um, some people in the community might have you know, other ideas or think that some expertise has been missed out and there might be some gaps in the um, yeah. in, in your own map. Yeah. So can you just talk to us a little bit about that expertise? I, I sure can, just give me two seconds. So basically, I made sure that we had an even spread of participants um, within the expert panel. So as I said, 10 organisations or individuals, depending on the makeup, were invited. Um, two of those representatives were from Noosa Council. Um, obviously, that's important because we are making sure that we're delivering this under the Noosa Environment Strategy. Then we had the community um, community conservation groups, so groups like Mary River Catchment Coordination Group, uh, NICA, uh, we had, so we had Noosa Biosphere, Noosa District and Land Care. Land care. Um, so we had a bit of a spread there and then I also engaged three independent wildlife consultants to um, complete the, the decision matrix. So making sure we're just getting that even spread so we're not introducing too much bias into the decision process. Um, and I think that's the fairest and, you know, I guess most robust way to go about that process. So I do believe we've got an even spread amongst all the different stakeholders. Um, and we had academics in there as well. So we're really trying to put it out to everyone. And, yeah. you know, and the benefit of that too, um, in that planning stage is obviously a lot of connections have been made to those groups who will be in instrumental in the implementation phase of the roadmap as well. Um, and that was important on a personal level for me, just joining mm -hmm. council as well, to make sure that I've developed those connections and, and increase the effectiveness of the implementation of the board. And through that process, did you get a lot of engagement from community, just writing in viral emails or...? No, it was a targeted... Yeah, sorry, it was a targeted campaign, yeah, for sure. So it was, as I said, it was distributed to those uh, key community conservation groups and then obviously the members within those groups um, were able to to contribute to the decision process and you know examples are that I held um, you know, a, a meeting with probably 20 or 30 uh, members from NICA and we talked through the process and we completed the decision matrix together and yeah so it was quite I guess um, yeah quite open to anyone that was associated within those groups and generally they're the people that have the knowledge and the interest in the environment to, to adequately contribute as well. Mm -hmm. So just moving forward, because um, we're looking at council, you know, engaging really good um, community, you know, engagement and how we can do that better. Um, we're always looking for continuous improvement around that. So mm -hmm. moving forward, people outside your targeted groups that you've engaged, yeah. which sounds fantastic, um, where's the broader opportunity for people in community who, you know, love the environment, have a keen interest in what's happening, mm -hmm. where do you envisage moving forward they have opportunity to put their thoughts to this? Well, I think um, if we take it into two steps, obviously we had the development of the roadmap. As I said, I really feel that that required people with a scientific background to decide those species. But moving forward into the implementation phase, well, you know, a lot of those different groups are going to be very instrumental depending on what species we're looking at. So, for example, with sea turtles, well, in North Shore Coast Care will be a key um, organisation that we'll be liaising with and developing the recovery action plan with. So I think um, if we combine our overall community engagement process and then we can direct people to, you know, if they are interested in this area, they can, you know, support Bull and Coast Care, get involved and maybe go through that avenue. Oh, 
comments from yeah. those opportunities that they yeah, see for sure. there. I think it'll be more about yeah, directing um, the general public towards those groups that are going to yeah. be instrumental for that species. Um, I think it's probably the only way that it can really be done and it does support those groups as well. So they'll, you know, potentially get new members from this process and more support and oh, more community good. awareness. So. It's probably a good opportunity for us to spruik our environment grants as well yeah, that yeah. are open for proposals to be submitted. So that's on our project page at the moment and we really welcome any of the yeah. community groups to come forward with ideas. and. Uh, um, as David said, it's that partnership approach that will make this successful, yeah. Yeah. Um, to work hand in hand with individuals and groups to be able to um, do the species recovery on the ground um, yeah. will be really beneficial. So those grants are open until the 12th of April. So um, yeah, welcome anyone to uh, come in and have a chat about what ideas they might have. So. Yeah, that's yeah. a great opportunity. It's probably important to remember too that, you know, it's not like Council isn't doing anything for these species already. Like sea turtles, we've done a lot of work over the last 12 months with them. But, you know, actually, actually documenting and consolidating all of those management actions, what we're doing, what we're doing next, we don't have that structure at the moment. And that's the idea of this roadmap. You know, we're not going to be re reinventing the wheel in terms of creating all these new management plans for species, it's consolidating what has already been done, what needs to be done, and having that clear direction for council that we can communicate to the, to the wider community. Yeah. I think that's the key here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Stockwell. Yeah, so David, thanks for that. It's a really robust process, and as you know, I have a slightly different opinion on the outcomes of your process. Um, and. I've been involved in the recovery of the Mary River Cod and the Mary River Turtle for nearly 30 years and the key concern is that we've chosen a species because it scored two points higher that is still yet unknown habitat within the Shire so it may be we don't have Mary River Turtle habitat in the Shire at all. In my yeah, 1994 I've never seen anything in our catchment that looks like a nesting bank for a Mary River Turtle and that includes research that's you know, where I've looked at a lot of creeks around the place. Compared to Mary River Cod, which scored a couple of points lower, which we know has historic and current habitat throughout the Six Mile Creek catchment. So I know you said we do recovery plans with those species jointly. I think we need to change the nine or conclude nine and a half. Is that the, to me, the Mary River Cod is a far more appropriate species than the turtle um, because of a its in-stream habitat is more representative of a range of freshwater aquatic species where when you're looking at the turtle the, one of the key the key uh, recovery actions is actually to try and get better outcomes from the nesting banks so reducing predation protecting the eggs even relocating eggs if there's floods similar to what you would be looking for down on the coast um, their fecundity is pretty low um, so yes, the in-stream habitat requirements do affect the, the species recovery. The cod, um, it has a whole range of things though. We know, for example, a couple of weekends ago, we had the conditions where we could have had uh, fish deaths. Uh, and this purely related to the sort of climate we're seeing now that's much more like a dry, um, a dry tropics where we have these long dry periods through February, historically dissolved oxygen. So to me, you know, the, the cod, because it's much better indicator of climate-induced changes within our system, um, it's also, you know, linked to yeah. the... Yeah. Please continue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks. Um, thanks uh, to the water use and the environmental flows, which is a major issue for the Six Mile Creek, because we haven't got any environmental flow potential for Six Mile Creek Dam. Um, and I just think we need to have a think about that. Uh, I think. I would, I would be moving a change, but I would probably do that in general committee so others have the opportunity to have a think about it. Um, yeah, I'm quite happy if it's Noosa nine and a half, so that the, the you know, like Harry Potter going to Hogwarts, that we've got the cod and then a part of that is the Mary River Turtle. I know the catchment committee is keen to do a survey to see if we do have Mary River cod, but it'd be unusual to have a species that has an unknown distribution in the Shire as one of the top nine. Um, yeah, so to me, I suppose I should have a question, that's what we're talking about, I'm talking. Your thoughts on that, how's that? Yeah. I got to a question, Councillor Finzel. No, <laughs> <laughs> I knew we'd get there eventually. 
<laughs> no, look, I, as, long a, as, as discussed, I do totally agree with your comments. Um, we did, in the desktop review process, exclude some species from the roadmap, and they were species that we were pretty sure weren't you know, occurring within the Noosa region. Um, but after talking with them, our C and other other groups, it was a high possibility in their opinion that Mary River Turtle was within the catchment. And given, you know, I guess the species conservation status as well, it's important that we do find out um, if they were within particularly the Six Mile Creek. Um, so that's why it was included in the in the shortlisted species. Um, I was expecting that Mary River Cod would get up over Mary River Turtle. But again, um, as I said, we did break the species down into their key habitat types and we made sure that we selected you know, a proportionally representative species from each of those key habitat types. Mm. Um, as I said, I was surprised Mary, Mary River Cod didn't come up. However, as I said, I, get, I think at the end of the day to keep that uniform and fair approach, we need to maintain the Mary River Turtle in the, in the Noosa Nine, um, given the stakeholder involvement in the process. Um, but in terms of targeting the Mary River Cod, um, more than happy to, to look at how we can do that. Um, the same thing stands for migratory shorebirds as well, for example. They weren't included in the show map because specifically under the Noosa Environment Strategy, we needed to have species that bred within the area so we could actually look, see if Noosa's Council and Noosa Council's investment was having a, an impact on the species positively. If the species doesn't breed here like migratory shorebirds, it's very difficult to track our management actions in terms of progress. So there are other species that this has missed um, because of how the Noosa Environment Strategy is was developed, I guess, and, and... We don't have to worry about whether it's nine or 10. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. So, <laughs> no, I'll be honest with you, in the new <laughs> environment strategy, it was six to eight species was the what was specified. Yeah. I went with nine to follow on from Tyron's work back in 2017, yeah, 2018. The marketing the pitch because it And that was done to maintain, you know, there is some media work that's sort of been done that with the wider community, so I thought maintaining that was important. I have no problem with going to 10 species as long as we've got the adequate funding and staffing to, to deliver that. At the moment, you know, um, we probably need to work on that side of things, um, particularly, you know, um, you know, we've got a lot on environmental services, but as I said, more than happy to include the Mary River Cod as an additional species, or as I said, combine it with the Mary River Turtle. But in terms of what's the best approach, well, we haven't actually looked at that yet. Um, but yeah, super open to that, and I think it's a very valid point. So, the support from council, I'd be more than happy to, to do that. Yeah, and I think it's very important. I've got another question. If I like the idea of focusing on the green turtle, yeah. I know this is looking at budget for next year. Mm -hmm. um, one of the key impacts on the turtle is the next high tide in the next full moon around Easter time when we have absolute idiots who drive up the beach over the nesting eggs. Yeah. Has, have we considered what the regulatory requirements are to actually protect the species on the National Shore as part of that recovery? Or are we intending yeah, to look sure. at regulatory so, options? Yeah, definitely. So regulatory wise, very difficult to control that. Um, however, what we have done within the last couple of weeks is I've actually met with Kugel Coast Care, QPWS, Kugel North Shore Coast Care, um, and we're looking to do a targeted education campaign across not just people who drive along the North Shore section, but camp up at Double Long Point, TUR, that section as well, and seeing how we can, um, particularly over that breeding season, combining with the school holidays, how we can drive an education um, campaign towards the users of that area to try to not just you know protect nesting turtles, but also, you know, people who do find turtles, the problem we have up there is the data as well. So we don't know where the turtles are laying because physically we can't be up there checking every day. So it's enabling those um, those community members to actually know how to report a turtle nesting site and then we can obviously look to manage it um, mm -hmm. more appropriately like we do on the Eastern Beaches. And recently the Tewa Beach Association has lobbied both state and council uh, in regard to a suggestion uh, which I think is the appropriate uh, regulatory response which is to stop cars two hours either side of high tide, would that be a benefit to the conservation of green turtles, do you think? Of course it would, because it would stop people from driving on the dunes. However, um, yeah, it's out of my scope to understand how we could enforce that. Yeah. Um, I think it would be extremely difficult. 
And I think short term, it's more about education and awareness. Um, yeah. It is a big challenge, but one we yeah. should take on, in my opinion. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Because it's like, you know, then you, you know, that area is also zoned as a recreational zone along yeah. the beach. It's different than, you know, pure national park status. So it is designated as a recreational area. And if you take that right away from people, well, I'm not sure if that's, you know, if that's Yeah, I think, well. think from memory, so, it's, it's considered a road. Yeah. And there may be provisions it's, under limited access roads. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It's also. Look, Obviously, the only beach in Queensland where you can get a permit to drive on for one day. <laughs> yeah, don't get me wrong, I, I fully understand what you're saying, and I, it's not that I don't agree with you, but I really think that community education... Oh, yeah, is, I, I think it's handy. ...is the I think only that's, way we can really tackle it, to be honest, at yeah. this point. <laughs> Thank you. That's my only question. Yeah. Well, um, okay. Uh, just coming on the back of the Mary River Cod, in the chart here, you've got even though it was in danger, that was fish and rays, you've got not applicable. So you told us today you've got quite a robust process around your panel that you engaged. Um, do we have enough time between this meeting and that meeting to actually get enough feedback around the Mary River Cod in relation to the turtle? And what does not applicable mean in that column? How did you arrive at that? Um. It's not page, there's no pages, so. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. Where are we going here? Ah, cool. Yeah, no worries. So basically, species are. Oh, you can do that this one. Uh, species are classified either under the EPBC Act or the Nature Conservation Act in terms of their conservation status. So, a species can be classified as endangered under Commonwealth legislation. But it can actually not be, you know, under the Queensland Nature Conservation Act, it cannot be classified as endangered or under threat. Mm. So how we went about with the roadmap is that we chose. So for each species, we just went with the default highest conservation advice species. So if a species was listed as endangered under Commonwealth legislation, we ran with that. If it was classified as vulnerable under the Queensland Nature Conservation Act. We basically ignored that and we went with the, the highest rating, if that makes sense, on the precautionary principle. Yeah. I've got a question, Councillor. Yes, yes. Um, we, Councillor Walkie and I were down last week at Pritchian and we saw a wonderful community member who was very much looking after newborn turtles. Oh, yeah. uh, she was sort of protecting them and providing sort of uh, pathways yeah. for them and things like that. Uh, although due to, they were due to be born, it was, it was right on hatching time, I yep. think. But she was working very closely with. Uh, Coolum Coast Care. Mm -hmm. um, so, with a lot of this work, are you hope? And because and she said they hadn't seen turtles, sort of for the similar reasons that you've just stated, yeah. sort of further south on the coast for a long time. Um, is this a hope to get them back a bit for, to migrate a bit further south, or will this be some of this work be in collaboration with um, Coolum Coast Care? Yeah, how how will it work? So basically. Um, Long story short, there were two successful, well, two two nests um, on the east, on the eastern beaches this year. Yeah. Two actually in the vicinity of Bridgen, so yeah. you were lucky to see that. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> she showed us a video. Oh, she showed okay. us she had no a video. Worries. We didn't see yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So Coolum Coast Care manages man manages those nesting sites. So okay. at times they'll relocate them if they're vulnerable to storm inundation and whatnot. Um, so basically, the idea of this recovery action plan for sea turtles is. Um, to address, I guess, local threats, which include obviously um, increased severe weather, climate change induced erosion. So that's supporting Coolum Coast Care to have the resources to actually identify those nests in the first instance and then look to relocate them if they have to. Um, the Sunshine Coast region as well has also been identified as an important resource for turtles moving forward. Mm. Um, you may or not be aware, but uh, the sex of turtles is determined by the temperature of the nest. Yeah. yeah, so we're getting issues that we may start to see issues further up around Monrepo area where, you know, whole clutches may turn out to be one sex due to... Mm -hmm. So it's really been identified as a hotspot for turtle conservation moving forward. Um, Sunshine Coast Council are very active, obviously, with their turtle care program mm -hmm. in turtle conservation. Uh, for the first year, we actually um, joined the Clean Up for the Hatchlings event mm -hmm. that was held in February, so that was a really positive move. Um, we applied for grants uh, alongside the Sunshine Coast Council to look at lighting awareness campaigns. Um, but long story short, basically all of this work will be done 
in conjunction with Cool and Cosphere because they are the, the main community group there that's you know active in that space. But there's also a great opportunity to um, team up with the Sunshine Coast Council, even as far as things like educational signage, making sure that it's uniform across, sure. not just the Sunshine Coast Council, but up to Noosa and making sure we're getting the same messaging across. Yeah, it can look different, but we have to have it uniform as well. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was fascinating to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. incredible. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Wilkie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dave, you mentioned that if we look after these nine species, mm. there are other species that share the same habitat for benefit. Um, councils, we all received a, an email on, from a, uh, a young environmental advocate who's present here this morning. I would just like to ask some questions on his behalf about um, the the reasons why um, species such as the estuary stingray, migratory shorebirds, you've covered that, beachstone curlew, grey-headed flying fox, Richmond birdwing butterfly, the swamp yabby, the honey blue eye, and eastern brown parrot were not included in the Noosa 9, and whether there's any way we can include any of those species. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, very fair point. So, at, you know, to take a step back, I guess when we are looking at um, threat and fauna recovery, let's be honest, it's the habitat that we're looking to improve. We can't really, you know, from a species level, it's very difficult to implement certain activities. Mary River Cod is probably one of the exceptions where we can look at stocking, but most species, it's about improving that habitat value. So obviously that does have flow on benefits to other species. Um, so in terms of actually nominating more species than what we have, um, again, under the Noosa Environment Strategy Framework and the resources that we have here at Council, that's probably not possible at this stage. However, what I think where the opportunity does lie is, you know, when we are implementing this habitat recovery for these certain species, we'd be very smart about how we do it. Um, as I said, Council's doing a lot of work in the space already with the natural areas team, doing huge, you know, natural area bush regeneration activities and whatnot. So it's just about being smart in the delivery. And we've also got to remember that, you know, as I said, this roadmap has gone through a very comprehensive stakeholder consultation process. And we've identified not just the conservation, the species of conservation significance, but obviously the species of iconic value to the Noosa region. And I think that's super important. So there's a reason some of these species have been nominated purely based on their iconic value to the Noosa Shire. And that's a very important driver in terms of getting resources, support, funding to actually implement those recovery action plans. So therefore having a larger overall impact by selecting some of these species over other species that, you know, justifiably could have been selected as well from a conservation perspective. So there will be flow on benefits for these other species? For sure, yeah. And we'll look to harness those opportunities. Um, so when we look to do a recovery action plan for a certain species, we'll sit down and be like, okay, cool. Well what other bang for our buck can we get here? Um, and I think, you know, we nominate the loggerhead turtle, but obviously the green turtle. So that, that sort of flow on effect, if, if that makes sense. So yes, It does. The other follow-up question, you mentioned an allocation for the care of the turtles. Can you give us a ballpark figure? Uh, Budget-wise? Yes, please. Yeah, no worries. So we put it into the, um, into the meeting report. Um, so we're proposing 15,000 for 23, 24, which is a pretty small amount, obviously. But, um, you know, uh, there is funding availability there under grants. We've already applied for Beg your pardon, I should have, I should have Oh, that's totally fine, yeah. So, you know, like, that's an important issue or an important consideration. So not all species are going to cost the same to, to implement these recovery actions. So that's why it really needs to be a staged approach. We need to reevaluate every financial year how many funds we need to deliver what we can. As I said, a lot of opportunities will fall under grants as well. Um, so things may cost more than other species, just depending on what opportunities exist. And we'll try to obviously tailor it into that yeah. that efficiency, I guess, into that, that mechanism. Yeah. So just on that point, given we've got young people really engaged in the space in our environment, we really want to think about our future generations moving forward. Mm. Um, and Rebecca, you mentioned earlier the opportunity through our community grants. Is this something that our younger people, that our former warriors that are coming up through the, the ranks, is this something that they can apply for 
and perhaps look at those endangered species that haven't quite made the nine? Is there something they could do through that process to see how they can, I don't know, elevate those species through research, through community grants, or engaging young people to come up with creative ideas to, to meet those challenges? Yeah, definitely. Um, we've, we've welcomed that involvement of the young people in our community around conservation programs. Um, Dahlia from the Environmental Education Hub is doing some great work with those schools and, and groups on on have, giving um, children that opportunity to have the experience on the ground with planting trees, taking water quality samples, um, removing weeds to, um, to really put um, conservation efforts into action. Um, it's so important and our conservation program is broader than, than this project that looks mm. across the various community groups that do do those tree planting projects. Um, our work with our private landholders with our conservation land management program. Uh, we also have an acquisitions program through the environment levy as well where we purchase conservation land. So when you look at it as a full suite of programs, mm. um, you know, there's many activities there that um, address threatened species management and lots of opportunities where we can engage with young people in that process as well. So um, yeah, all, always open to those ideas, always open to partnerships and um, yeah, it's, it's a really positive way uh, to, to make sure it, uh, others can be involved in the program. I might just add to that real quickly. So nominating sea turtles this year is obviously a bit of a strategic thing as well. So let's face it, everyone loves a sea turtle, everyone loves a hatching. Um, so I think that's a really important avenue for us to gain momentum behind the roadmap moving forward, which will then increase that community engagement for all the species. But yeah. it's about getting this out there too, and sea turtles are just a perfect candidate for that, and we can achieve that if this is approved before the, the breeding yeah. season starts in November. Yeah. I think having you know outcomes that are measurable and that we can achieve mm. and you know give a big tip to is fantastic yeah. for the environment and for our young people see coming through that we are making progress mm -hmm. in that space. Thank you. Amelia, mm -hmm. have a question? Um, hi. Um, in terms of actioning the roadmap, I'm really quite interested in that mm -hmm. um, and in the implementation plan. Um, my question is, what sort of outcomes are we likely to see? So I'm talking in terms of, um, you know, things like uh, ecological <coughs> management plans. When a development comes into council through planning, um, will this feed into a criteria um, and an importance when an ecological management plan is paid for by a developer? Will we be directing, you know, when, you know, um, what time of day, where should you be, um, you know, investigating whether a species is breeding or not breeding? I don't know. I'm, I'm just mm. keep, keep going, you know, rights of nature. Is this going to feed into a pledge by Moosa Council that <coughs> nature rights? Um, is it going to are we going are likely to see amendments in our planning scheme that again gives further rights to <coughs> these protected species? So can I get an idea of those sorts I might, of things? I might pass that one over to Camille. I think she'd be... Hi, hi. 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 <laughs> um, so there's a few areas where we're trying to feed <coughs> that. So firstly, the Noosa Design Principles are currently under review at the moment. And we had a meeting last week, um, Sally, around making sure it's more sensitive design is a big part of that, including lighting for turtles, that sort of thing. So that's the first area where it's coming in. We're also reviewing the construction specifications, the standard construction specifications, which is a big part, um, and making sure that, you know, for all projects, um, you know, they've got construction environmental management plans, erosion and sediment control um, plans, that sort of thing. So that's another area where we're looking at um, making sure that we're setting the benchmark, I guess, for environmental management in that area. And I guess, yeah, potentially from this, you know, looking at the planning scheme, if that's recommendation as well, then yeah, I, I guess it would just depend on the certain species, um, but for distances, that sort of thing as well. So, yeah. Fantastic. Um, and the <coughs> measurable, and I think that's, um, yes. you know, I reference also Spencer's 
leather and um, you know it's called for action and yep. we'll, we'll share all that but he talks about um, you know true enemy um, of our environment is not climate change it's apathy and I love that we're actually getting into that space where we're actually making some noise about what's important to the community um, and that's our environment. Yeah, well, we're having conversations with state government too around that acquisitions process and trying to get them understanding of how, particularly in the offsets, because they're a huge money, amount of money sitting in that offset fund. Yeah. How are they targeting that investment to ensure that it's, you know, prioritising certain species or not just focusing, because it's just currently based on regional ecosystem um, mapping. There's no other consideration, which is a big limitation. So trying to have a look at, you know, even our acquisition process, how we can develop a, a framework that other councils can use but also other state governments could use to better direct that investment as well because conservation land and protecting those existing um, remnant uh, ecosystems is crucial as well. So, yeah. um, last question, I'm also guessing an outcome of our infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure, that's also going to be part of this bigger conversation about protecting um, our dune systems um, for, for turtles, for example. Yeah, it has to be holistic, that it can't be just an engineering focus for, mm -hmm. for, for delivering stormwater outcomes. It needs to be a whole of catchment consideration, um, looking at natural flows, looking at habitat type, looking for environmental health, looking at filtering opportunities using certain species um, understanding what species are using the habitat from a flora and fauna perspective. So um, that's, you know, it, it does need to be that whole, that whole approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. I love it because being proactive in a call to action, I sit on the Heritage Committee and I don't know if everyone knows, but right now we're doing community consultation out to community. We want everyone to get engaged and the section in that is about identifying trees and, um, in, and what are the value of those in our environment. Mm -hmm. So our peak body as councillors is the LGAQ, as you know, um, and they're currently working with the state to look at amendments in planning schemes and support local council mm -hmm. to get the outcomes that everyone's talked about here today. So um, I encourage everyone to get online to the Heritage Survey. There's a great opportunity to action forward here. And are you, are you aware of that? And can you speak to us a little bit about how that's coming through from the state to help local councils deliver and protect our heritage? Yeah, I'm not. I've been involved in that, and it's something, yeah, it's certainly yeah. something we're really interesting to be interested in, particularly yeah, right. cultural heritage and how we can better ensure that, um, yeah, it's considered, like, to, particularly in the Noosa Trails as well. Mm -hmm. um, we're working with national parks and, and close to the Kabi Kabi on that as well and, and one of the things is you know looking at the trails master plan and, and trying to reduce the number of new trails for example that we put in and, and reduce those impacts and, and utilize existing um, pathways instead of putting new ones and simple things like yeah. that so yeah. it is being captured um, but yeah definitely it's something yeah. we need to look at developing further so mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So I think the timing's really good because we've also, you know, we've done our corporate plan. We're looking at bringing everything together, and um, and I think this is part of it. And you're going to see that moving forward. We're going to see this response and this action mm -hmm. by council to engage with the community to, um, you know, find out first with the community what we value. And I think council and state government, and all levels of government, are ready to to move forward. Even up one little steps, we're all heading in the wrong direction. So thank you. I have a final question, sorry Tom. Yep, go for um, it. We all received the email from Spencer. There was also a request in the email that the statement for the Regional Climate Action Road um, Map um, can be read. Can I just pose that question for the general meeting and request um, and ask that um, someone can read the Climate Action, Action Road Map you? Um, at the next meeting. I'll leave that for some consideration. We'll provide advice, we'll, Council. Through the CEO, yeah. We'll provide advice. Thank you very much. Um, excellent heritage advocacy. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's taken three years to bring, bring that together, so I'm excited. Yeah. I, I, just looking because I'm just looking and thinking across our our species, and I like how you've you've broken it up into different ecosystem types, and that will give us 
a, a span of species that will be indicative and will, you know, most of those species will have uh, significant challenges ahead with climate change, whether it be through <coughs> temperatures, whether it's through extreme weather, <coughs> through change fire regimes. There's one there that I don't recommend we put in, but it's an interesting one in that we haven't got a raptor, but a powerful owl. And I know in the UK they use their raptors a lot as indicators because they will pick up, because they're at the top of the food chain, they will pick up the changes in the small species and in, in the UK it was about all the heavy metals being built up in, in the birds etc. And, and so it's it's one, it, I suppose as I said it's pro probably, it's powerful hours also an interesting one is it was the icon species used for the initial campaign to try and stop the clearing of the ringtail euro for pine forests because uh, it used to occur in those forests, probably still does. Um, and so, yeah, 30 years later, uh, we're replanting the powerful owl habitat. But, um, yeah, just just an interesting one. I, I looked all and I thought, yeah, it covers most of the things, and I thought, yeah, well, just there are a range of uh, ecosystem conditions that the species we've chosen won't necessarily pick up, but you can't yeah, get everything 100% perfect. And that's, that's exactly right. Um, there's definitely holes in this, let's be honest. Like, it's yeah. pretty much, it was a very difficult process mm -hmm. to try to get everything to be uniform, fair amongst everyone, making sure picking up every little bit of thing. But having that really wide stakeholder engagement process picked up holes in this in the initial yeah. phases, and that was super important, you know, getting that advice from different people, academics, consultants, um, you know, Brad from MRCCC, you know, he's got so much knowledge out there with Mary River Cod, Mary River Turtles, and just, you know, really getting that input in the development of this was really important as well. And I think that's value added to it, you know, mm -hmm. as you've moved on through the, through the process. Yeah. yeah. So on the back of that statement then, is there anything, are you going to do like a gaps analysis on this or have you already done that? Um, no, I mean, we've gone through a pretty extensive desktop review process. So we identified the gaps that already existed, Philburn. Um, but obviously annual review, not just of the roadmap, but of yeah. the conservation recovery action plans for the species will occur, so, yeah. I'm going to, oh, do you want to say something? I just want to say, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that this brings effect to the, um, what, what's out there, what the community groups can use to help um, uh, advance their, their desires, their, their wants. Mm -hmm. And I, I can see um, the nets, the, the shark net from the loggerhead, you know, the, will, will probably bring that, you know, the, them into focus as well since mm -hmm. it's um, upcoming breeding seasons because there's lots of uh, opportunity and, and discussion of moving the nets at, during certain yeah. times, during whaling yeah. migration and, and different times and it'd be, it may really be a disaster to catch a loggerhead turtle in the nets. Definitely, yeah. And, and as I said, Council's already involved in a lot of these talks and discussions but we haven't formalised it for each species so we don't have that clear direction for stakeholders in the community. How are we actually addressing impacts on turtles, you know, yeah, we are, you know, jointly running a shark smart, surf smart awareness campaign, which you're well aware of in this advice for environmental services, you know, in that space there to, you know, have discussions about shark nets moving forward. But as I said, just consolidating them all into recovery action plans for the different species, that's why we need this roadmap. And that's what I'm proposing basically, that we have that direction moving forward. So. Well, I'd like to also say that this has been a great discussion. Um, I hope we've exhausted a lot of our discussions for before the general. But um, <laughs> Jill has asked it for this to be moved to the general as well. I'll move that. Okay. Oh, we've done that. No, and that was the last one. Oh, Kathy, yeah, yeah, vote, vote on it. Yeah, Carrie, all in favor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a more report. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm out. Uh, yep. I, Councillor Stewart, inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in relation to number 10 in the list of applications in the delegated authority report. As my husband and I have a friendship with Robin Yates, who is associated with the Apple Hill Promoted Distilling Co. I also have a prescribed conflict of interest in relation to number 15 in the list of applications in the report. So I'm a board director of Young Care, which is associated with the applicant DeLuca Charitable Foundation Limited. As a result of my conflicts of interest, I'll now leave the meeting room on the matter is considered and voted off. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay. We'll oh, go to, <laughs> we'll go to um, number six, planning applications decided by delegated authority for January 2023. And we have Patrick in the room to 
Do you, if, do you have anything to, to say? No, I think you said it. it's the uh, report for the uh, items that were decided under delegation for the month of January. We've got about 30 items that were decided between um, development assessment uh, through operational works, building works applications. Have you, did you realise that there were all approvals? That's what the report, yes, is about those that have been approved. No, no, sometimes there's refusals in there, isn't there? Uh, there well, there's that's correct. It would be some that were decided on the side. Um, and, and, and that was the reason for this report initially coming to Council when, when it first commenced, was to demonstrate that um, while some matters that were coming to Council were being recommended for refusal, that there were a lot of um, applications that were being decided under the delegation that were being approved. Yeah, well, this is the first time that they've all been approved. Quite sure. <laughs> I'm happy to move it. I'll second it. I, I did have a question. Okay. Oh, sorry, Do you want sorry, to talk to sorry. it? Oh, no, yeah, no, just a, it's just a more general question is, you know, with um, the increasing rate, uh, interest rates, are we seeing a change in the number or nature of applications that are coming in over the last few months? Um, there was probably a dip going into Christmas, maybe, um, but we're certainly seeing strong numbers. Um, and we have a weekly meeting where we review the new applications. We're having pretty strong numbers um, over... 10 applications a week, which is which is quite strong. Um, still a range of applications. Maybe some of the complexity is dropping maybe back a bit, but uh, you probably see, need to look at that a bit more over time to see what the trend is. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Billy and Councillor Frank, any questions? No, thank you, Mr Chair. Okay. Uh, Councillor Stuckwell has moved it, Councillor Finsel seconded. Oh, did. I thought it was you. Left the other way, left the other uh, way. I didn't. Oh, you didn't? No, Councillor Finsel moved it and you seconded it. Oh, is that right? <laughs> That's what happened. Okay. <laughs> That's, it's a long meeting. I know it's not. Okay, fitting the vote. Uh, all three in favour? Okay, well that's it. Um, there's no confidential session. There is no confidential session. Uh, yep. We have two two things referred to general and yes. Yeah.